Hi, I'm Stefan Moritz and this is The Service Design Show. I'm Mark Fontaine. Welcome to the Service Design Show. Uh, we had a special location uh, during this episode because we are at the uh, Global Service Design Conference that is taking place in Amsterdam uh, at this moment. And I'm lucky enough to be sitting next to one of the pioneers of service design because I can remember that reading one of your early uh, uh, papers and that was one of my first interactions with service design. So welcome, Stefan. Thank you. Um, for the people who don't know who you are and what you do at this moment, how did you get involved in service design and where are you, what are you doing at this moment? So I got involved in service design by birth. Uh, <laughs> my, my mom was working in web technology, which at that time was physical, uh, but she was actually hole punching programming when, when I was little. And my dad has worked with service, so I also kind of into that quite naturally. And then I stumbled into it really when I started in Cologne, uh, studying the integrated design, but yeah. immediately picked up on service design and worked with Birgit and made that sort of my thing. When, when, when was that? Early 2000? Must that be was so. 1998, 99, something around that. Yeah, you were, yeah. you were really one of the first batch of yeah. service design minded people. I mean, at that time, it was really like, uh, it sounds like a really good idea. Was, and, and it also made kind of perfect sense, right? It's like, okay, it's the same philosophy, just applied to a different context. Mm. And because the, the, the setup in Cologne was kind of very versatile, you had like, let's make a fridge for Siemens. Well, hang on, could that be fresh food delivery? And, okay. you know, yeah. it, it became really yeah. clear what it's about and why it's important, but then how to actually do it was what we had to figure out. Mm. Um, what has happened since the days you were in Cologne? Where did you, how did your journey look uh, so until today? When, when I was in Cologne, I figured out that uh, to, to do this is not only about different uh, design dimensions, there's also other parts beyond design. Uh, and there was a lot of interesting stuff going on in Milan, mm. which conveniently also fitted with I liked Italy, and uh, so, so I went to Italy to figure out what they're doing, uh, have a slightly different perspective on things, and then also learn Italian, and then I went to Helsinki to explore the other side of Europe, mm. and that was super cool. I really loved the like, you know, different uh, outlook on life, nature, and so on, and, and also very interesting university. And then I went to London to start working in a company, figuring out what that could be in, in real. And then at some point, so I thought I need to go back and do my master's, otherwise I'll never finish. And that was really cool to work a little bit and then have the possibility to go back. And that was exactly when the services and network was sort of really taking shape. And it's sometimes in life it just fits uh, to have the opportunity to visit everybody that was doing that from IDEO to live yeah, work. And yeah. Engine, we did like a it workshop was in together. For, the, for your master. You had, yeah, exactly. Yeah, had, okay. So that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, really good. And now? And now I'm in Stockholm, which I also like very much from a total culture, life, uh, for family, a super mm. nice place to live. And I work in a wonderful global medium-sized company, like small enough to mold stuff and big enough to make stuff happen. Um, it's in an old church in the middle of the forest. Um, the forest. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's also one of those things when you look at life in the rear mirror, it's unbelievable that it's possible to find a place like that. And they want to do uh, integrated design with the focus on service design and so on. So it's, it's nice. Cool. Um, Stefan, I, uh, you already gave a hint uh, in the, your introduction about this, but I'm still curious. Do you actually remember getting in touch with the, with the field or the term service design? Do you, do you know the first time that you, you read about it, you heard about it? Well, I mean, it would have been when I was already in Cologne. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I, I stumbled on it when I looked into studying there, but it really hit me when I was there what it's all about. Mm. But I don't know sort of it was Tuesday morning, it was oh, raining. Okay. No. Some people have a very vivid memory about no. it, but, I, it, it no, but it was infused in your life. No, but honestly, to me, it was like finding one of those things that just made so much sense. Um, and, and, and I guess people still say that, right? Yeah. That a lot of yeah. service designers say, I, 
I wish I knew it existed 10 years ago. Yes. I, I found it. Hmm. But obviously, since then, I have been preaching about this a lot, and you go in different iterations on that, and you realize that actually it's two very unfortunate names put together in an unfortunate name. Why? Well, well what is unfortunate about it? For most people, when you talk about service, they think about, um, well, either sort of restaurant, cleaning the tables, or call center, or like, you know, one aspect of service-ish things, yeah. Um, yeah. but not the experience, yeah. really. Yeah. And when you talk about design still today, many people think about funky stuff and nice Tables, things. Lamps. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, you know, that is also nice being at this conference, I mean, whenever you come, but especially this year, sort of reflecting on all of that, that journey that um, it has matured so much and it's unbelievable that it is that big of a movement, that big of a network. And it has a lot of diversity in it, but there's also really sort of consistent streams and red threads. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. You know the format. Uh, some people might not yet know the format, but I've got three topics that you handed me uh, that I'll be using, and you have some papers with some uh, question starters, and mm -hmm. we'll combine these two to make interesting questions, right? Cool. Okay. So I'm going to pick um, the one that I think is most puzzling, and it's a topic called <laughs> Superhuman. Do you have a question starter that goes along with that one. Should we make it draw? Okay. How can we? <laughs> Explain and yes. make a question if you can. How can we be superhuman? So the, the thing that I wanted to, to think about with, with uh, and I mean, in, in these moments, it's always kind of when you meet interesting people, a good way to connect and think out loud. What fascinates me a lot at the moment, and I mean, you, everybody's probably heard a lot of chat around uh, chatbots. And what happens with, when these kind of things happen, trendy things happen, clients are like, oh, should we have a chatbot, right? But I think there is some really interesting uh, shift going on where a lot of companies are investing a lot of money in optimizing their services. Yeah, yeah. Finding differentiated service models, trying to be smarter in how we deliver. And it's not dissimilar from when Lean was going on. And it has a very internal notion. It's like, oh, the world is changing. We need to be smarter. Can we do it a bit uh, streamlined mm -hmm. and a bit mm -hmm. more uh, intelligent or, and have machines and computers sort of do the work for us? And there is a, there's a danger from a service design perspective that you're losing the human touch. Mm. And on the other hand, you have a lot of services and a lot of experiences where you know, high touch is extremely important. And what do you mean with high touch? That things are extremely personalized, extremely you know, kind of tailor-made. Mm -hmm. uh, like the ultimate service is, you, you, most people imagine something very sort of, somebody takes care of me and it thinks for me and it's very like you know, some aunt that you visit in the countryside or your grandmother, that sort of feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot about feeling, it's a lot about really reconnecting to ourselves as human, letting go of technology. So there is like this interesting thing going on. And what I mean by superhuman from a service perspective is like how can we help technology to be smart and make decisions for us but not lose the human touch and how can we have a human level of quality that is aided by tech to be good. So you know, high tech, high touch, yin yang, hybrid, something. And I think that's really interesting. I, I listened to a lady that's researching how to teach machines empathy. So how do we get robots to understand humans? And she's come to the point where the robots understand humans better than humans. Do. What do you mean? Okay, that's fascinating. Exactly. We... So, you know, if, if everything becomes robotic, and I don't even know what that will... I mean, some people call that singularity mm -hmm. when, when a point comes when that thing is as smart as we all together. Mm -hmm. So not just as one, but mm -hmm. as we all. And I don't know if it's called robots or machines or, you know, there isn't even a good name for the super part in this. But for me, the most important thing is that we don't forget to be human. Mm -hmm. And also from an innovation standpoint, when clients ask us, so, okay, how do you know what people want in the future? The human part isn't actually changing an mm -hmm. awful lot. Yeah. Right? We've all yeah. been humans for 2,000 years and we're not dramatically different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, soft, there software there upgrades, yeah. yes, but... You yeah, know, yeah. No. That the basic needs are the, the the basic values don't change that much. Right? Yeah. So, for example, the personality of somebody doesn't change so much in a lifetime. So that's something you can really work with. Mm. 
uh, values. Mm. They depend on society and context, sure. But you know, trying to just understand like what are the things that don't change mm. that quickly and that help you understand behavior. Because I mean, if if you look there again, it's like everybody's talking about big data. But how do you make sense of what parts of that we should really care about? So I think the combination of that, really embracing tech, but not forgetting human and and finding sort of a way for companies to really tap into that hybrid combination. I think that would be exciting. Does it exist at the moment, that hybrid combination? I, I do think it exists. Uh, the first time I really thought about this was when somebody showed me Card Munch. It was a service that uh, I think it only existed in the US where you can basically take a picture of a business card and it then uses Mechanical Turk mm. for somebody to manually type it into your LinkedIn. Yeah. Now Evernote has that built in. Yeah. But yeah. It sort of made me realize that combination of humans doing what humans are good at and tech doing what tech is good at, that combination is actually really powerful. But mm. I think what we're seeing now is that it gets more and translated to an experiential layer to a point where you, it's kind of a bit scary because you don't know. If it's is this new, is yeah. this Lisa? Or is You know, who is writing to me now? Yeah. So it's kind of a bit interesting. So... Um, Where do you see this topic going in the next three, let's say three years? What are the big things that will change there? So I think in three years, what you will see is that how companies respond will be more human. I mean, companies have always thought of their brand as a persona, right, or like our brand personality. And I think that will go to an experiential level where you can really orchestrate sort of an, a cross-channel presence of a brand persona. So Sounds complicated. What do you mean? So uh, practically speaking, every point that the customer interacts with is sort of done by somebody else. It doesn't have one mm -hmm. feel. Yeah. And if you can orchestrate this technically, that's kind of consistent and nice, but you have no no fun and no friction. Yeah. And, and yeah. so yeah. introducing a human experience around that, I think will be very interesting to, to really understand how you can use data, you can tap into behavior, but you don't make it creepy. And I think that from a design perspective, that will be very interesting to learn the thresholds for different generations and for different kind of people, what, where do you what get, makes sense. Where do you get your inspiration around this topic? So if people are interested in what you're saying, where should they look? There's this place, the interweb. But it's big, I've heard. It's a big place. Now, I don't really know. I mean, obviously, you get it from conferences, from talking to people, from reading books, from, but so you can't really mm. pinpoint that. Okay. Um, it, 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 it's different nuggets that then somehow marinate themselves into place. Uh, I don't know. Okay. There, there's no okay. Just Google. special. Uh, yeah, get, Google. Get better at Googling. Google will tell you what you should find. That's, that's the that superhuman. Me, yeah, that's maybe creepy already. <laughs> Stefan, let's move on to the second topic. And I'll pick uh, this one because uh, it's maybe not the most sexy, but it's definitely a hot topic oh, in the service be. design uh, community. It's a topic if you do what if, it gets very sexy. Okay, make it sexy. What if and related to scaling? So uh, the reason that I put it up originally is that in terms of impact, m many things that we work with, you know, It's doable to figure things out in one lab, in one project, in mm. one sprint, mm. but to really make it live and make it scale is a challenge. And I think with many organizations that aren't used to working with a service, to, to make it live and to make it scale and keep it alive is a real challenge. But I think there's another thing that I've been thinking about a lot the last two weeks, months, is the, around the sort of employee, co-worker aspect around scaling. Because oftentimes we talk about customer experience, we talk mm. about service design and the, the human element. Now we've talked about superhumans, but people that are involved in delivering the service, they, they get often under designed in. So, so we don't yeah, enough please. really think yeah. about the, from an experience point of view, how, they, how the two really hang together. And I think, again, it's easy to solve in, a, in one store, in one channel, but to, to, to really sort of work out how services and can scale and what principles we can build uh, for that connection to work out and to mm. live and grow and develop. Uh, I think that's really interesting. This is, I think, if I understand you correctly, this has also been a topic on a 
some of the episodes that in order to design good services uh, that are scalable, we should start designing at the internal organization side, yes. or at least it should go uh, <coughs> hand in hand. And now we have a lot of focus on the end user. Is that what you're saying too? Yeah. And I mean, the end user is still the saying. And what, like, if you go back to how do you get scaling to to work? Traditionally, we've done a lot of stuff with sort of manuals and and briefing people and so on. And what I've seen from from a leadership perspective, so I think leadership for service design, leadership for customer experience is incredibly important for us to learn and for, for, for us to work with. And uh, what, I've, what I've noticed in many programs is that leaders have still a notion of we need to make people or we need to get, you know, can you come and help us get the people to have empathy or ignite innovation or... And when you, when you work with uh, our methods, uh, you, you can see that actually this is already within people. Mm -hmm. So the scale is not in sort of cascading out and teach the teacher, but more tuning in with what's already there, you know, allowing people to let go of some of their fears mm -hmm. and, and structures and actually sort of just, just be yourself. So, so um, scaling happens naturally if you put it in the right conditions? Yeah, so creating the it, conditions that, that exactly. How do we create the conditions that scale happens naturally? Yeah, and and what are your findings on that? What are your latest insights? So what what I what what fascinates me and what gives me a lot of uh, pleasure in my job is when you see through empathy and through human connection, you know, stuff clicks into place and people that are maybe in IT, maybe in, in some other part of the organization that doesn't directly impact the customer, sort of feel like now I know why I come to work mm -hmm. and sort mm -hmm. of find their purpose again. And I yeah. think a, a lot of organizations are struggling, uh, especially in sectors that are being commoditized, telco banking, to attract cool people that would rather go to some funky uh, big brands. And if you want to attract really good people that can drive innovation that are f modern, uh, you, need to, you need to have your purpose in place. Mm. So I think there's a lot of effort actually going into now, like you said, creating the, the conditions and maybe there's a different design of the organization. Maybe we need to think about again. So le less about process, but more about principles mm. and, and belief systems. Yeah, and, and the, the big challenge is, of course, like you said, we already seen this happen within labs or mm -hmm. experiments that there you can create those conditions and where exactly. you see it happening exactly. but then scaling those conditions on our large corporation that's 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 a big challenge and and maybe it's it goes even i don't um daniel your man who was one of the guests on the show said we shouldn't be designing services we should be designing organizations and maybe i don't know if we can do that but maybe he's got a point there well, I would even go one step further that we've been designing organizations now, but we need to design something else. And it's, it's to do with connecting to the purpose of the organization and the leadership and sort of create the conditions mm. for that organization to thrive. Because then, I mean, you, you still need, to, you still need to, to be effective. You still need to build small and then scale, you know, nail it mm. and scale it. Mm. But on the level of really understanding the values, and, and making it relevant to that country, to that organization, to that uh, team. Uh, because, I mean, oftentimes we, we, we try to sort of impose something. So no matter where we're coming from, left field, top down, uh, it, it's more trying to understand, like, what is it that we can unlock? Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Just assume it's already mm -hmm. there and we just need to help it to come out more. And all of a sudden you have scale. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the successful scale platform companies, Airbnb as one poster child, you can see the innovation is happening because it unlocks something that's already there. And, and then you why get ubiquitous value. So, why is it so value. hard for companies, for tra traditional organizations to do this? So, if, so, okay, if you look at another phenomenon that's happening, uh, most established corporations want to be like startups. So they look at startups and they try to do the same thing without understanding the reasons why the startups are 
successful in the way they are. And I think one of the reasons um, is that there is less fear, there's more freedom. Um, and it, I mean, it's not that people in startups don't have dogs to feed or children to protect, right? But they, they have a different mindset. They have less to lose. They feel freer. And I think that is this sort of starting point to be really in touch with, you know, finding a purpose and doing something about it. And I mean, of course not, we, we only hear about the startups that succeed. That is also yeah, one thing yeah. to remember. Yeah. Um, but I think big companies need to sort of understand it's, it's about really understanding what, what, what are we really about and how do we make sure we have space and time to, to really do that without mm. fear coming in the way. And of course, to set up a little lab is one sandbox you can create where you can take fear out. But I've seen it so many times that then even in that thing, the urge to show off and the urge to succeed is so big mm. that they don't really want to fail. And I think in, in terms of scaling, how do you do that? One of the most important things that we need to learn, and I mean, that's, you know, our community together with the, with, with the clients or government organizations, whatever it is, is to really embrace learning, which is a bit of a cliche thing to say probably, but I think there's something really, like when we work with prototyping, people are not used to the language of prototyping and they don't really know how to use it to learn. They, they want to use it to show, they want to use it to explain, they want to... So Make there is, one prototype and then... Yeah, so there is a shift needed from, and that maybe also leads us to the next topic, that it's not about teaching, or it's not about showing to the rest of the organization what it's about. It's like, this is not about making a prototype so the stupid IT can understand. This is a prototype so we can learn mm -hmm. what IT could do mm -hmm. about it and how together, you know, mm -hmm. just shifting that perspective in together, we, we all want good things, how do we learn instead of you know teaching the line organization how to do this and that and that department and how do we get the French people you know it's like there is still this notion of scaling means roll out yeah yeah, yeah and I think scaling yeah, is about yeah. roll in scaling is about roll in we'll, we'll keep that one uh, in mind scaling is rolling all right and uh, as you hinted upon the third topic let's just move in uh, before before it's too late and your third topic is story doing. I'm not sure if I heard <laughs> that on, uh, on the show before. Yeah, I've stolen that from somebody. All right. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not a bad thing for us. No, that's fine. So uh, what is the question started that goes along with story doing? So the, the, the story doing thing we've, we've been discussing a, a lot has just sort of popped out out of nowhere. And there's actually is there a few a people... No, no, there's no question. Oh, it's okay. Like, there's no question. It's just a cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger. Okay. So a story doing is the opposite of storytelling. And for me, on, on a high level, it means a lot of companies have spent a lot of time in marketing in a sort of advertising mindset. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's similar to how we talked about in how to change culture and, and so on. But as a company, you are not what you are telling you are, but it's about what, what, what people actually feel you are. So customer experience, much more important than advertising. And still, there is a lot of money spent on advertising. But I think there is, there is a shift and there are some companies mm -hmm. that are doing that better than others. But I think ultimately, when you look at service design and why it's so powerful is that what you do is more important than what you say. Mm -hmm. The experience counts more than your promises, right? And, and I think that shift is, I, I thought it was going to come quicker and bigger, but I think it's now really starting to happen that companies realize is not good enough to tell their customers what they're going to do. But it, this is like the, the, the quote that uh, your best marketing is a good service, right? It, it aligns with, yeah. with that. And why do you think yeah. it's happening now? Because hasn't this been a topic in service design for the last 10 years? Or is there a significant change going on? No, I think for us it's been an obvious topic, but I don't think that the, the massive shift has happened mm. yet. So, for example, if you look at pharma companies, I remember that I spoke to the head of innovation at a huge global pharma company and asked them sort of, you know, hand on heart, if you look at the investment in powder and drugs and little white stuff versus the impact, you know, what would you say is the balance of the, the value in the actual compound versus the value of life mm. in not taking your pills on Wednesday night. You forgot it on Tuesday morning. You know, like all the stuff that happens versus the research and effort that's gone into the perfect drug. 
And he said, if we're lucky, 60, 40, or maybe 50, 50. Mm. And then you start thinking, well, they spend like billions. And I mean, it's important. It's like people's life at risk. So you don't want to mess around with cheap uh, pills. But it's like just sort of valuing. So Holger said yesterday, 85, 15. Yeah. And I mean, that, I think that's, uh, that's probably being nice on ourselves. Uh, Berger did some research many, many years ago about research investment. It was like 3% versus yeah. the, the so, rest. So the it's investment like, in R&D to services compared Let's look to at time spent, yeah. effort yeah. spent yeah. On, on different yeah. things. Yeah. 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 And, and I feel that there is a huge change now in, in healthcare that companies realize, well, it's not good enough to offer a solution in form of, of, mm. of, of something, mm. but we need to really produce an experience that is enhancing outcomes. Mm. And there is huge value for society, there's huge value for individuals, and there is also money in the, uh, in, in the works. And I think when you bring a service design perspective, so a lot of the work that we do at Verde in New York is around connected health, working with you know, kind of more understanding patient experience and building something that really creates better outcomes. And I think that will continue to be a huge trend that, that companies need to figure this out. And this is just, healthcare is just one example, and, and pharma is just one example. I think many companies will start to see that the value chain is bigger than what they do. Life is bigger than what they do. And if they understand and embrace how people really live their lives, and what is real, I mean, there is the jobs to be done type thing in it, but I think it's bigger than that. Even uh, bigger. Yeah, so I remember I had this really weird, uh, funny thing happen. I did a, a seminar uh, in Eastern Europe uh, about service design, and I had a slide with a drilling machine and a hole, and, you know, it's not the, the, hole, the, the drilling machine that people buy, they buy the hole in the wall. And as I was doing the workshop, it was drilling behind me because there was like a bit like earlier here, yeah. you know, some works happening. So very bizarre, I think. And then three years later, I, I, I was in the same taxi with somebody at the conference. And I remember the thing that you did, and I've been thinking about it. People don't buy the hole in the wall. They buy the picture mm -hmm. hanging up on the wall. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can, you, can th and you can talk about the experience of art in your home. So you can, you can push that on, but it's just like shifting perspective into what is really going on what really makes a difference, where is really the impact. Mm. Um, and it's not easy. Mm. Like it, it is easy with stuff, right? Like, you know, we've yeah. designed this thing, it's nice, people buy it, cool. But with, with the kind of ecosystem service, it, it's not so easy to put your finger on so, somehow what it is. I, I have the feeling that all of your topics um, drop back to the, to the purpose of organizations, to the why of organizations. Yeah. yeah. Why are we doing this? The meaning now? of life, you mean? Yeah. Well, maybe the meaning of, of why are we as an organization here on Earth? Yes, but yes. Is it, do, you, do you recognize that red thread throughout your topics? Well, I mean, it's kind of what it's all about, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at why do we have organizations, whether it's public sector or, uh, or, or private, it's about people. Mm -hmm and doing something good for, for people. But maybe in, in the course of setting up big systems, we've we sort of forgotten a little in, bit in about it. In the course it. of scaling, right? That, yeah. Because that's we scaled in a different way. And in, in a sense, to your point earlier, and I think, I think it's, it's refreshing and encouraging and, and, and beautiful that we are sort of reconnecting uh, to the sort of human-human mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's humbling in some ways, it's um, inspiring in some other ways, and it's still also very frustrating because it's not, it's not that hard to, to grasp, but it is incredibly difficult to pull off. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, if, if we, we have designed this heat uh, camera a uh, few, few years ago, and I sometimes wish, like, you know, if you could do a heat photo of office buildings and you could have a heat map of the time wasted, I mean, imagine what those office buildings would look like. They're just sending emails to each other about PowerPoint. And who, who is creating value? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there is a lot of wasted time and a lot of... Like, if, if you talk about the idea of, um, of value as abundant value... That, and again, I mean, Airbnb is a very concrete example. It's like stuff that didn't create any value was just sitting around empty all of a sudden does something different and touches people and it makes a difference. And I think there's a lot of nice, nice examples where, 
we can see there is different ways. And it's not just about, oh, cool, they have more hotel rooms than Hilton. But it's like there's something really interesting happening. Stefan, we have to move uh, to the, almost to the end of the show. And I always have two questions that are not on paper. And the first one is when people approach you with the question, I want to get into service design or I want to become a better service designer. What, what is your ultimate tip? What do you say to them? Hmm. I mean, if you want to become a service designer, um, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, for example, coming to this conference is an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But in, in a sense of taking a step back from what you do and, and find inspiration. Um, because it is, whether you're in it already or you're new to it, service design is a, a messy thing that keeps changing and it's not so easy to put your finger on it. And I think my main, my main advice would be you can't do that much damage. Um, if you have a learning mindset and you're uh, you know, trying to reach out, there's so much that you can do every, every day to figure it out. And coming here is always sort of a reminder of all the things that you wanted to do and could do mm. and you get some new energy. Um, and I think sometimes in organizations it feels we are, we are trying to convince everybody that this is a good thing. Um, but then there are those moments where it just falls into place and something cool is happening. And I feel that if, if you want to be good at service design, it's about being good with, with people. It's about being curious. And I, I think most, most people have, have the ability to dream up a, a better way, but sometimes they don't take the time. Um, but I think, you know, creativity is something we spend a lot of time on the last few years to cultivate. That's not the problem anymore. But I, I love about design that it's also about doing something. So I think that would be probably sort of the ultimate. Try to do something and then you can learn and maybe take also time to reflect. So do, something along those lines. Do and reflect because we've been... Do and reflect. So I started in, in everything that I do now, I, even if it's one minute in the end, I mm. make sure there's time to reflect. Yeah. And it's incredibly valuable. So in every workshop, the rating goes up by one point. Because people, you, know, you just give people time to land and digest. And I think in our fast-paced lives, um, it's not always easy, but it's good. Good investment. One minute. All right. Well, keep that one in mind. And the final, final question is, if you leave uh, Amsterdam back on the plane to Stockholm, Stockholm what is the question that keeps you busy at this moment? What is the big question that you have? Right now, I think, uh, I was talking with Kerry earlier and, and we, were, we were talking a bit about the, the topic and, and to me, a lot of things root back to the meaning of life, but also to, to fear. So what, what is it that we can do to help people be less fearful and less uh, blocked up by being afraid? Because I think that, could free up a lot of energy like you know what are we worried about and if you look in a global context we have it so good and it's so easy for us you know as a white male guy in Europe it's like I don't have a clue how easy I have it mm -hmm. and you know that that is sometimes good to remember and like what, what, what's the worst that can happen right? yeah. yeah but I think it's like to help organizations move I, I do believe that it's a very important question to figure out how to inspire people to be less afraid. If people have suggestions. I yeah, bring it on. Com comment, comment on the video. So uh, that's all we had time for. There's one last thing I, <laughs> I have for you and you've seen it already at the conference. This is your very own service design helmet. Um, very good. Wear it with pride, give it a nice place in the very day uh, studio. Oh, it comes and, with like, uh, oh, even a manual, instructions. Even a manual to how to. See, use. even a, a helmet has a service that comes with it. Yeah, it's probably Can't yeah, get it needed. Out. So, uh, cool. thank you. Again, thank you very much. Stefan, and uh, have a nice trip back. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, and thank you. Thank, thank you. If you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with service design pioneers like Stefan, subscribe to the channel and be sure to check out some of the past episodes. Thank you.
Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.